Meanwhile, Chinese President Xi Jinping recently met with Russia's President Vladimir Putin, with both vowing to significantly increase international trade in yuan instead of dollars. Both leaders advocating for the use of the yuan in settlements between Russia and Asian countries, Africa and Latin America, and calling for a new era and, quote, changes that the world hasn't seen in a hundred years. Yeah, well, what I'm seeing is that battle lines have been established. And this has been coming, I mean, we've been so arrogant in this country to export and show people that if you don't do what we want, we cut you out of the global financial system. So uh, this is not a surprise to me because this is this discussion and building out that infrastructure to be able to accommodate complete de-dollarization, even over at the IMF with their substitution fund, they already set up the de-dollarization position on a global basis, particularly, you know, the the IMF is part of this. And that is every treasury secretary and every central bank chief, almost, not not 100%, but pretty close to 100%. Um, So yeah, I think that alliance is, is strong, it's alive, it's more surveillance oriented, and there is not one doubt in my mind, but that the US is losing that advantage, because that advantage means that the whole world had to hold dollars. Well, if they don't have to hold dollars to buy oil, they can they can hold you on. It shifts the power from the West to the East, and right. it kind of like handing off the baton. But um, that can happen in a heartbeat, especially through the substitution fund. So those other countries, when they talk about when they talk about that will their membership will expand well countries typically want to go to strength and i don't think the us is showing a lot of strength and i think that that we're also forcing other countries whose currencies are pegged to the dollar into positions that that they can't support this is a global issue so the whole globe is resetting. Now, when you reset a system, then you're going to have um, countries that are going to step into that new position in a stronger position of power. Who who is who has the most debt? Because all of that debt has to be burned off before they can put a new currency out there. Because as soon as you put those commodities and gold in to back a currency, then that's going to fix the debt wherever that happens to be. And I don't care if you're looking at China or you're looking at Russia or you're looking at the U.S. or anywhere else. These debt levels, not that they're not sustainable, they're not payable. So, right. And what supports these all of these global currencies is the full faith and credit of the respective governments. And they've used that piece up. Mm-hmm. So so the way that I can see it and the way that I reconcile it is this isn't just a U.S. issue. This is a global issue. And in order to push the agenda, they need a big enough crisis to get people just to follow along. The U.S. actually tried to give back the world reserve currency status then. And what that means, just really simply, is if you are a government or an individual or corporation going outside of your borders to buy that oil or back in the day lumber, anything, you had no other choice but to use U.S. dollars. Well, if Saudi Arabia and the oil producing nations, OPEC plus, who's that plus? Oh, Russia, gee, if they now accept gold, rubles, yuan, any currency to buy that, that means the petrodollar is dead. And that's the only reason that the US retained its status since the seventies. So there are too many things, you're right, on a global stage, we have really used up the confidence of the world because we've just been exporting inflation, you know? And and if you go back and you listen to some of the uh, tapes like um, 
you know, uh, de Gaulle was saying that the U.S. was abusing its privilege. Yes, we've abused our privilege a lot. And now all those dollars, that fake market for dollars, when that goes away, then all those dollars come back here. And the IMF created what's called a substitution fund where anybody, any government or probably also corporation in the world can deposit their dollar denominated assets or instruments and they would be converted into SDR denominated assets or instruments. Right. So my guess is that that's going to be the next world reserve currency, but uh, that doesn't look very good for the US. But we've also got the BRICS coming together with their different reserve currency backed by commodities, a collective reserve currency from all of these countries together backed by commodities, including gold, including oil. Do you not right. think that that is the more likely replacement here? I really, I really don't because it's not, I don't think it's broad enough when we get into this digital currency system. I think that they still need one that is more broad. And since the, I mean, you're talking about a basket currency that's backed by commodities. First of all, in order for That could for be them, a, a digital version of that as well. A digital. A, absolutely. But it has to be easily convertible. And I don't know that that would be globally easily convertible, like the SDR would be more easily convertible. And the okay. weighting of those BRICS currencies can be much bigger inside of the SDR. All right. But then you'll have the global currency and you'll have the local currency. And that's what the dollar is going to end up being, is just a local currency. It's not a far stretch to look at the choices that our government and our central banks have made to see that they pick winners and they pick losers. And you and I are like the right size to fail. So no, there. I'm sorry, it's at the end, it's too late. There, there was an opportunity. And, and for those countries, because I have a lot of people that say, well, China's going to back their currency with gold or Russia's going to back their currency with gold. And ultimately, yes, because that's how they're going to regain the confidence. But they have to burn off all that unpayable, not just unsustainable, the unpayable debt. They have to burn that off. And the way that governments, especially advanced governments, do that is by hyperinflating the currency so that you're repaying that debt with currency that has no value. Well, guess what? Individuals can also use that same strategy, can't they? So just by holding your, your purchasing power value in this teeny little package enables you to protect yourself, your wealth, retain your freedom, retain your choices. And that puts Saudi Arabia on alert saying, well, maybe we don't want the U.S. to maintain the role of protecting us as the agreement had been since the 1970s. And then they went and signed a pact with Russia for protection. And of course, Saudi Arabia is integral to this role of the potential BRICS currency. Uh, they want to be Absolutely. part of the BRICS. They've applied for membership. As we mentioned, China recently brokered a deal between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Let's understand the role of the petrodollar here, because Saudi Arabia, usually a U.S. ally, has said that it's open to accepting Yuan for payment of its oil. As mentioned, it's exactly. currently applying for BRICS memberships. Now, the, the Saudis um, have said that they're also building a $10 billion refinery and petrochemical complex in China. That's Saudi Aramco, which is the uh, nationally owned oil company. Now, Saudi Arabia is at the crux of the U.S. petrodollar system ever since the 1974 milestone agreement between Nixon and Prince Faisal. So the fact that oil is primarily traded in U.S. dollars gives the dollar its power. How significant Correct. would it be for oil to not be sold in dollars? That, that's the nail in the coffin. That's like that. Honestly, that's the last piece of the U.S. dollar using losing its world reserve status because, uh, you know, again, we're we're kind of arrogant and we have definitely we have alerted the world that you either do it our way or we're cutting you off. And the world doesn't like that. 
So that just furthers that shift. And to make it easy, there's already a fund where any country that's holding dollar denominated assets can just deposit them into the IMF. And then the IMF can convert them into SDRs or and then you can convert the SDRs into yuan or any other currency. So, uh, yeah, I mean, this is it. We're, we are at the end now, whether or not China <laughs> and Russia is going to be the next world reserve currency, the yuan or the ruble. That is, in my opinion, doubtful. I think it's more going to be the SDR because it just makes a whole lot more sense to me. All right. Well, in that clip, we had President Putin and President Xi say that they are going to make changes to the, that the world hasn't seen in a hundred years, calling each other friends. And they earlier pledged that they want to move the global trading system away from the US dollar. Is this de-dollarization trend accelerating faster than you expect? Oh, I don't know that it's faster than I expected, but this de-dollarization trend has actually, it started back in December of 2002. So what's been happening is that it's been accelerating. And I mean, I don't know. I mean, this could just be a coincidence, but when you look at Saudi Arabia, I mean, the whole reason why the US dollar kept its position as the world reserve currency was because of the petrodollar. Right. And this talk of de-dollarization, it's accelerating, but they've been putting all the infrastructure in place for a number of years now. So this is not really new. But yes, I think it is definitely accelerating. And I'm wondering if it is just a coincidence that Saudi Arabia was a big backer of, of Credit Suisse and then Credit Suisse put sanctions on Russia. And then all of a sudden, Saudi Arabia wasn't going to come up with more money to save Credit Suisse. So how much did they lose by, you know, being, what was it, the largest or second largest shareholder? I mean, and and Switzerland is more aligned with the U.S. So, I mean, is that a coincidence? So, Lynette, how do you reconcile these two ideas? I mean, does the U.S. want to lose its dominance on the on the global stage? I mean, surely not, because it's been such a source of power to have the U.S. dollar as the king of global reserve currencies. You know, I mean, I know that we tried to give back that status in uh, 1969, back in that period of time. That's when the SDR was created because we tried to give it back. But um, so, I mean, sometimes when you just know you're at the end, then what are you going to do? And you're going to play into that so that you have some level of, of advantage. No, I don't think that we want to just give it away because then we lose all of that advantage. And those that live in the U.S. are going to feel the pain of that more than anywhere else in the world because we've had this advantage for so long and we and we don't realize it but it would be easier to do the de-dollarization using the IMF's F substitution fund rather than because a reserve currency isn't necessarily the world reserve currency it's just an additional reserve currency does that but make you sense? don't you don't think that the US would not give up without a fight that there could be a kinetic war to try and preserve this level of status that the US has enjoyed and many would say abused? Well, that's the point. I mean, if you want to maintain a status, then you probably need to maintain allies. And from my perspective, when I see what the choices that we're making were pardon me, pissing people off or pissing countries off. We're not really um, trying to maintain hmm. that alliance as well as we should. I think we're more bullying than we are cooperative. So, so I, I guess it's a, it's a question. Firstly, do you see that there will be potentially a war to maintain 
the oh. status of a physical kinetic war? Well, I think there already is a war that's that's going on, and I think it's a proxy war. Okay. The Russia, I think, Ukraine. I think we're already at war. And I think the other part is um that that the people are used to seeing boots on the ground war, which is this proxy war between Russia and U Ukraine. But look at how much support we're giving one side, China's giving the other side, et cetera. So I'd say that we're already in that proxy war, but the real war is being fought in cyberspace. And mm -hmm. that's something, again, that's hidden from the normal public to see. And some people think that that's been going on for a number of years already.